someone cuts you off in traffic. A lady in line at the grocery store is rude to the cashier. What if our first response is to ask why? Finding compassion in the midst of tension helps us be like Jesus, and it's easier said than done. Priscilla Shire, Natalie Grant, Dr. Anita Phillips, and Hosanna Wong are joining us today. Come on, let's talk about it. Earlier this month, I went to the happiest place on earth, where I assume is most people's happiest place on earth, Target. And as I was in Target, I saw these two women at war with each other. And one of them was an employee, one of them was a customer. And this specific Target had uh, changed the line situation somehow. And the customer was not happy about it. And she let the employee know it. She just said, you need to do the signs better. There needs to be more signs. You need to do the lines better. She was so upset. And she says, you know, you need to help me know how to do this. I've never done this before. And the employee was shaking and she responds, for sure. <laughs> There should probably be better signs. I don't really know what I'm doing. I could do this better, I'm so sorry. The customer yells at her one more time, you need to do your job better. And then the employee says, I've also never done this before. And as I was watching these two women, it was like seeing myself in two forms. <laughs> I was like, I can totally relate to these two women. <laughs> like one of these women is like, we are in a situation in our lives that we've never been in before and other people are supposed to help me. And the other girl was feeling like, man, I'm supposed to be helping people. This is my job, why don't I know how to do this better? And in that moment, I saw myself in both of these women in times when I felt like other people need to be helping me out. Other people need to be helping me get through this situation, this season in my life. And I have just as much felt like this employee, like, man, I should be helping people better. Like, for sure, there should be better signs. Like, I'm sure I could be doing this better. <laughs> We're both in a really hard situation. And as I saw both of them, and myself like a mirror through both of them, I honestly started to think in my own life, God, in what situations in my life am I one of these women not seeing the other woman's side? Like perhaps, perhaps there's a better way to communicate under pressure. Perhaps there's a better way mm -hmm. to see the other person's side under pressure. Like, God, what can I do under pressure so I am not also yelling at strangers at Target? <laughs> like, Lord, please help me. <laughs> and I think it's a question we need to ask ourselves and a conversation worth having. What are we doing under pressure? How are we seeing other people who could also be under pressure? Are we stopping and considering, man, this person might be grieving, this person might be going through a hard time, this teacher might be having a hard time, this parent might be having a hard time, our pastor might be having a hard time, our spouse might be having a hard time. Is there a perspective shift we could have when we're about to be aggressive towards someone? Is there a way that we could perhaps pause and say in the middle of this pressure, I'm not gonna let the enemy have victory over my emotions or my aggression. I'm gonna pause and consider, is this person doing their best? What could they be going through and then proceed from there? I wonder if there's a healthier way. Dr. Anita, do you have an idea of how there could be a healthier way to approach these kind of high tense situations? You're talking about having compassion on people. And that's what we're called to do as Christians, right? To love and compassion is a form of love. And it helps to do exactly what you said. See yourself in the other person. When have you cut someone off in traffic? When have you gotten frustrated and snapped at somebody in the store? Put yourself in that position. What might you have been going through that day? Maybe you were overtired. Maybe you just got some bad news. One of my narratives for getting cut off in traffic is maybe that person's rushing to the hospital because they just got a call that a loved one is sick. Maybe they are angry and just not paying attention. You know, you don't know what's happening. And so in order for us to have compassion, we have to stop telling bad stories. A good 70% of our lives is imaginary. And I say it that way because we are constantly making up stories in our minds about why other people did what they did. We are filling in the gaps on their intentions. Wow. And unless we get to ask them and they have the presence of mind and the emotional awareness to actually be able to tell me, I really don't know what that motive is. And so we make it up. And we can go, well, that person just doesn't like their job very much, or they just wanted to hurt my feelings. And you just go, it's just like, boo, you're making that up. Like, so if you're going to make up a bad story, make up a good story and uh, go ahead and have some compassion. Put yourself in that position. What would you want someone to think about you? 
Because too often we take things personally when it hardly ever is personal. Usually people are just mm-hmm. acting out of the space that they're in and you happen to be in the line of fire that day. So I think we start by making up good stories, thinking the best of someone, no matter what's going on in that moment. And when we make up good stories, we're happier too. I love that. I love, you know, that's that's hard to do because sometimes you default to that person is just stupid. <laughs> And I don't want to deal with that right now, (laughs) right? Am I the only one, Natalie? Um, But so I think I think what we need to do is default to love. You know, Jesus showed showed us what to do all through the scriptures. He talks about showing compassion. He went he went into the cities and he was moved with compassion, and I love that about him. He had compassion. It wasn't you, you know you're an idiot and I don't want to pray for you or heal you today or judging you. He just had compassion on everybody. And on the cross, he even said, Father, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. So here they're putting him to death and he's got compassion and he's asking God's forgiveness. Priscilla, I know you're so good at this (laughs) to to (laughs) default to love all the time. Help us that are slower to default um, here today. Just (laughs) help us with that, would you please? I love you so much. Oh, I'm so Lord, glad you're on. I, I love you too. You, you guys are all girl. So I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, and you must love me because listen, I, this is something that I struggle with and wrestle with just like everybody else. But I will tell you that it has been one of the things that I wish now 21 years into my marriage, I would have gotten a little bit of a handle on in year two. <laughs> because if you just take a minute, even with your spouse. Yes to actually think that the reason why they reacted that way or the reason why they responded that way or did that or didn't do that, that there's backstory there about something that may have happened in their day or something that happened in their childhood that actually, if you just took a minute to explore where they're coming from, man, that has been so helpful to me in my marriage with Jerry at this point to just pause for a minute and go, okay, is there something there that has been hurtful to him that I don't even know he's wrestling through or something that is totally unrelated to me that is just about his work life or his ministry life or other relationships that he has with friends or whatever, and he's wrestling through that. And what I just experienced is coming from something that actually, if I take a minute to hear him and actually care about him enough to explore it, then actually God's going to use that to put compassion in my heart and then use me as a solve and as a bomb and as a soft place for my husband to land. It's taken me way too many years to learn that, to just take a minute to care about him enough to ask, where are you coming from? What's going on? And how can I be a blessing to you? And can I just say, as we were talking about this, I was sitting here and thinking not only about my marriage, but I was thinking about how whole groups of people are antagonistic to each other and at war with each other because of this one issue of compassion, that it is oftentimes easier, at least it's a key issue, not the one issue, but it's a key issue, because it is is often so much easier to stay in a stance of dismissiveness rather than explore the option of empathy and compassion. It's easier for me to hear what the problem is and then just dismiss it and discount it as not really an issue because maybe it's not my issue. Rather than believe me when you tell me the shoes that you're standing in and then say, instead of me critiquing and picking apart and telling you how you could do it better and fix your life, I'm just going to come stand in your shoes for a moment Feel what you feel. Mm -hmm. See it from your perspective. There is unity that comes, not just between individual, but between whole groups of people when we just say, I hear you, and I'm going to stand in your shoes and have compassion instead of take that time and energy to critique you and to judge and to tell you that your problem is irrelevant. That's a whole thing. That's That's a whole thing that actually we could do an entire show on. Because I think that's part of the problem is that 
we get stuck down in the weeds. Do you know what I mean? We, we, we get ourselves in arguments that we don't even belong in. And you see so often people getting stuck down in the weeds. And you're like, you, if I just even, I don't even like to look at Facebook anymore because you look at all this, you know, everyone's got an opinion and everyone's so strong when they're just behind their keyboard. Mm -hmm. But what I find to be something that's interesting is that we're not always willing to give compassion, yet we expect everybody to give it to us. So I always, in a, in a situation, I'm like, well, you have no idea what I'm even going through. And we want people to give us the compassion that we ourselves are not willing to offer to somebody else. I'm a big believer, not just because it's a biblical principle, but because I've experienced it in my own life. I'm just such a big believer in the principle of sowing and reaping, that what you sow is what you reap. And I've even found in my own life that that which I am longing for, when I begin to sow that, even when I feel like a person doesn't deserve it, when I begin to sow that consistently, consistently, I'm sowing compassion. Consistently, I'm sowing understanding. Consistently, I'm, sh I'm sowing empathy. Eventually, I begin to reap that which I'm sowing. Yet, if you are sowing bitterness and discord and uh, you have a lack of empathy and you have a lack of understanding and you don't even model a desire to understand, I think I actually said this quote earlier in the week. But Priscilla, when you started talking, it made me think of it all over again. I'm telling you, Clive J Davis can preach. And he gave that <laughs> quote that said, instead of trying to discredit it, try to understand it. So instead of constantly trying to discredit what somebody else is feeling, I'm not always going to understand what you're feeling, Dr. Anita. I'm not always going to understand what you're feeling, Hosanna. I'm not going to understand where you're coming from, but I just need to take a moment and try to understand where you're coming from. And that always, to me, starts with a conversation. Instead of reacting or responding from a place of, I know better, and how dare you, and you need to know better about, you need better signs, and you need to explain better, lady in Target. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of that, just having, okay, I don't maybe understand, but how about we just get back to that, just even the human spirit of saying, let's have a conversation. Let's just have a conversation where I try to understand you and hopefully you'll try to understand me. Good. I love the practical tool of taking the action to pursue a conversation. Mm. I love that so much because I think it can be so much easier to think of compassion or gentleness as something passive Mm -hmm. um, or sweet and meek and behind the scenes. Like I feel compassion at those people. I feel gentleness at those people as opposed to towards those people. What would it look like to have active compassion? What would it look like to have active gentleness? There's a commentator who talks a lot about gentleness and I love what he said. He said that gentleness is the act of saying, I'm going to fight for you, not against you. And I love that so much because I so often think of gentleness as like sweetness and you know um, something really beautiful and maybe even something passive. I'm gentle, I'm gentle, I'm gentle. But I love how this commentator brought it. You are gentle towards people. You have a gentle posture towards people, compassionate posture towards people. When you go into a situation and think, as I go into this hard conversation at work, as I have this confrontation with this friend, as I go into this, this hard situation or confrontation or conversation with my spouse, I'm going with the posture of I'm gonna be for you and not against you. I'm gonna fight for you in this situation. I don't need to win and you lose. I hope we both win. I hope the truth yeah. is ultimately what wins out. I hope reconciliation is ultimately yeah. what wins. And yeah. so I think compassion that is not active is not true compassion at all. And to be a gentle person does not mean to be a quiet person who's always sitting down doing nothing. It means to approach situations thinking, how could I fight for That's these people? Good. And if I can't do something I think I can t put my hands to, like how can I actively pray for them consistently? How can I actively have gentleness towards this woman at my church? How can I actively compa be compassionate towards this, this um, group of people at, you know, at my job? Compassion and gentleness is active. 
And I think the question we need to ask ourselves is not what do we feel towards people, but what are we actively doing to pursue reconciliation with each other and restorative relationships with one another. Mm -hmm. So I love, Natalie, that you talked about Very having good. active conversation. Yeah. I love that as well. And I think it speaks to what all of us are seeing happening in our, in our culture this year, that compassion is seeming to be absent. Uh, it's, there's cruelty and there's judgment and there's cutting and there's attacks. And I'm just talking about the body of Christ, okay? I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about what's going on in the body. You know, when Paul said, your na the name of Jesus is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, because I have seen cruelty in the body of Christ this year that is unimaginable, and it is the absence of love. The Bible says the love thinks the best of people, and it says love keeps no record of wrongs, and I have never seen so many wrongs listed by people who call themselves Christian ever before in my life. I'm challenging the people of God who are listening to go read that love chapter and hold yourself accountable to every verse without saying, but, but they, but this, no, buts, no, if, ands, or buts about it, baby, you are called to love. And without it, you are not related to Christ. I feel like this is important to say though, is that you know that it's actually okay to show compassion for somebody's situation. And it doesn't mean that you don't have compassion on a bunch of other issues. So it's actually possible to say, I feel you in this moment that you're in. And it doesn't mean that I have to say, but I also don't agree with this. And I, and I, and I feel compassion for this. And I don't agree with this. Cause I feel like in this moment in our culture, if you're trying to stand with somebody or people or an issue of the moment to say, we see you and we value this thing that you're going through. Everyone's like, Oh yeah. Well, what about this? And how come you're you're not speaking up about this and how come you're not speaking up about this and you just kind of want to say for a moment you know what when Jesus showed up to heal the man at the pools of Bethesda he wasn't saying that everybody else around didn't need to be healed but in that moment he was focusing on that man and his issue and he said today you are healed and I just feel like we just need a moment where we all take a deep breath and say we can stand with one person or one issue in the moment and Everybody, you don't have to take it upon yourself to remind everybody about all the other issues in the world that they should be standing for. I just needed to get that off my chest on, for a moment. And, and you did it beautifully. <laughs> and you did it beautifully. Because like you said, we, God is with us. Yes. He's with us in that moment. He yes. was with the man by the pool of Bethesda. That's, yes. He's with us. And we don't yes. always know how to be present in a space where we are uncomfortable. Yes. So we either try to discount the space yes. and make a run for it, yes. or we'll have to sit in the discomfort, which is yes. something that we've been talking about all week. And you sit yes. with your emotions. And so we have to watch out for, again, I've said this so many times, allowing culture to inform how you do Christ. Oh, so and we drop that right. ball and we're not showing love. We're not allowing ourselves to be convicted by what it means to love because our culture is mm -hmm. consumed with who's worthy and who's not. And I've heard us say that sometimes. Well, I felt like I deserve this. I didn't deserve that. We do it to ourselves. We do it to other people. Who's worthy? Who's not? Who's guilty? Who's not? We're all guilty and we're all unworthy. And so we should all be grateful when God does yes. anything for any of us. And this idea of needing to decide, I can't tell you how many DMs I get when I'm talking about racial justice or other issues that set people off. I can't say how many DMs I get of people saying, how, how can you speak of those people? Um, those people are evil. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, are, are you even a Christian? Jesus. Who are you to call an entire group of people evil? And if they are, while you're calling them evil, how will you ever be around them long enough to show the light of Christ? It's scary. It's wow. scary. We're not loving yeah. like Jesus. We're separating ourselves and being self-righteous and we're lacking compassion. And the saddest part of it is that the compassion you refuse to give other people, you refuse to give to yourself. You have no compassion for yourself. 
you're tearing yourself apart. You're shredding yourself. You're holding yourself to impossible standards. You're holding yourself to being guilty for something you did 10 years ago, and you're still upset about it, and you still won't bring that pain into God's presence. You have no compassion on yourself. That's why you can't have compassion on other people. And it's undermining your emotional health. It's undermining your mental health because you are dragging around all this emotional baggage, and it is ruining your spiritual life. It's not taking away your salvation, but it's ruining the quality of your spiritual life because you're carrying around all this emotional mess. <laughs> and so that evil that you can throw at me, I know you throw it at your, you can throw it at yourself. And even if you use self-righteousness as a shield, you are in trouble. You are in trouble. So please start practicing some compassion for yourself. Start practicing some love for yourself, some forgiveness for yourself and recognize like Priscilla said, Hey, maybe I'm dragging some stuff from my childhood. Like she said, let me look at my husband through this lens. Let's look at ourselves through that lens. Maybe I'm dragging some stuff from my childhood that I need to lay down. And because of that, I'm snapping on people because of that. I am impatient because of that. I am depressed. And, and yeah, we've prayed about it and we've put scriptures on it, but it's still here. If emotionally you are feeling horrible and bad more days of the week than not, more months of the year than not, you may need some other help. And I want you to know that it's okay for Christians to go to therapy and get that help. It doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. It just means that God has gave a space for you to have help. So if you're struggling to love, then something has hardened that heart. Something's made it stony. Something's made it cold to protect you. And if you allow God to help you get healing through the word and church with your friends and at the therapy office, man, when that heart becomes fertile ground for good things again, you'll be so glad that you did. And you'll be a better representative of Jesus in this world. And that is worth anything. That's worth anything. Well, thanks for joining us today, folks. That was awesome. <laughs> um, you know, you're talking about, Anita, I think you're talking about every person on the planet right now. And we need to stop labeling everybody. We need to get out of our boxes. And there's two boxes. There's the love box and the hate box. <laughs> we all need to jump in that love box. And I think... You know, I think everybody would say, Priscilla, that this year has been such a year of testing and trials. But I would like to maybe change that and say, maybe this is the year of proving. Maybe this is the year of God proving himself through you. Maybe this is the year that God would give you um, the opportunity to do something you've never done before. Maybe to reach out with compassion like you've never maybe felt before. And to have feelings, uh, Priscilla, uh, showing empathy and love and defaulting to love every time. We're not talking about a white box or a black box or a Republican box or a Democrat. We're not talking about that. We're talking about our fellow brothers and sisters, everyone that was made in God's beautiful image and to see God inside of every human being. And um, that's been difficult for a lot of people, uh, especially, especially this year. I mean, the, the circumstances surrounding um, everything. We need to run this race. We've been talking about this week. We need to run it. We need to focus. We need to run. We need to run with compassion. We need to, to run with mercy and love and grace to everybody that surrounds us. And um, we need a lot to lay at the foot of the cross. I just love you all. Uh, Natalie, you haven't prayed this week. Would you like to, to pray to. us out this week? This Absolutely. has been beautiful. Beautiful, Lord, beautiful. Lord, Father God, I feel like I'm more reminded than ever that we need you. Jesus, we need you. We need your presence to permeate every aspect of our lives. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you begin to control our thoughts and our emotions and our, our hearts in a new and a fresh way? God, I pray for so many who are watching that just need to learn how to actually submit their heart and their mind to you, um, how to lay down their hurt, how to lay down anger and bitterness and to allow the Holy Spirit um, to take over that aspect of their life. And Lord, 
Lord, I also just pray as we wrap this conversation today for your capital C church, as Hosanna says so often, God, that you would make us more unified than ever before, that our conversation would not be a distraction from the gospel, but that our compassion, our love, our empathy, and our unity would be an attraction for a world that needs Jesus more than ever before. So God, we need you. We recognize that you are on the throne, that you are in control, and that you are sovereign over all things. And we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe today and you'll never miss a new upload. And don't forget to check out our Better Together shop. Thanks for being a part of our community.